what's the worst case scenario with all this stuff? I just said, what's the worst case scenario? And she's like, well, I guess the worst case scenario would be if your plan falls through and, you know, the world's crashing down, you go back to work. And I just thought, oh, my gosh, it's so simple. Like the worst case scenario in a fire plan is that you go back to work. Welcome to The Fi Show, where you get a behind-the-scenes look into financial independence. Here's your host, Cody and Justin. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of The Fi Show, but I could not be doing this thing by myself, so let's check in with the co-host, Justin. What's going on, man? Well, I've actually been doing still some social distancing, but on a bigger scale, so I've been trying out this website called Boondockers Welcome alongside my new camper van to do some trekking down south, but... You know, the awesome thing is you grab some gas at a gas station, you park in somebody's driveway, you still don't really have to be around people. So feeling pretty good about it. And it's a fun way to kind of see some of the countryside and get out of the house. So that's what I've been up to. How about you, Cody? Yeah, so I haven't been doing much of anything like I've usually been doing. But this past weekend, I told you (laughs) before we were testing out all the fast food chains and giving them ratings. And this weekend was not so impressive. So we hit up Sonic. It was a 30-minute drive. And I think Sonic got a cumulative 5.6 amongst me and my roommates, which is not the hottest on an out of 10 scale. <laughs> That's kind of a dessert-only place in my book. Yeah, it wasn't anything special. But before we dig into today's episode, let's take a quick pause for our partner. Keeping track of your net worth is one of the most important things you can do on your journey to financial independence. If you don't have an idea of what your net worth is, there's no way that you can keep your quote unquote score. One of our favorite tools to keep this score is called Personal Capital. If you haven't already started using it, it's an online software that basically compiles all of your data, it crunches all your assets, all your liabilities, and spits out a net worth number and allows you to track it day by day, month by month. Yeah, Cody, one of the big things that hold people back when they're doing activities like tracking their expenses or tracking their net worth is just they look at it as a big burden. And this allows you to go in with one username and one password and access as many financial accounts as you have. These can be loans, these can be 401ks, these can be HSAs, bank accounts, credit cards. They're all linked there. The other thing I really like about personal capital is it's very investing focused. So you can go in there and look at your allocation across your entire portfolio. So you don't just look at your allocation in one type of account, but your allocation as a person completely. And if you want to use the same tool that me and Cody use to track our net worth, which is completely free, you can do so at thefyshow.com slash PC. That's thefyshow.com slash PC. Today we have Scott Rickens, who a lot of people will know from the Playing With Fire documentary. But Scott wasn't always into financial independence or saving money at all. And it's really cool because we get to dig into all the spending that he was doing before, how he made that change, how he became an entrepreneur. But we don't want to take away all of his thunder. Take it away, Scott. My dad was in the Navy. I was a Navy brat and I traveled around all my life. And my mom, she would pick up a job if she could when we would move to a new place. And she had a, a teaching credentials. So it was oftentimes like a guidance counselor, or a teacher, or something like that. And so, you know, my dad was typically gone for weeks on end, if not months on end at a time. And my mom would kind of have to run the household. So my early memories was, you know, my mom paying the bills, my mom going through the mail, my mom doing all those things. And I remember my dad, whenever anything would come up, you know, like if there was a purchase happening of some kind, he would always be like, we got to talk to your mom, you got to talk to your mom. And so that was kind of my early stage recollection of personal finance was my mom ran the finances. It's funny talking to her now post fire journey, she did what she had to do to make sure they didn't go into debt. And she had picked up odds and ends of like, oh, retirement account here. Here's how you do this with the military. And she had that support group within the military, right, of her friends saying like, oh, yeah, you should do this. Or did you hear about this new thing that came out? But that was the extent of it. Her mindset wasn't how do we grow wealthy on a military budget? It wasn't how do we retire early? It was dad's going to put in 20 plus years. He's going to get his pension. That's how we're going to live. So in that mindset, you know, they're they're hardworking fairly conservative with their money, pretty frugal. And now looking back, like they've set themselves up so that with that pension, they really never have to worry too much about money again, as long as they don't really spend too much. On the flip side, here I am sitting in Coronado, California, which is, I was actually born in San Diego and my dad was in the Navy and there's a big Navy base. Well, there's a bunch of different Navy bases on Coronado. So that was 
part of the reason why we lived there. It wasn't like, oh, look at this amazing, you know, million dollar mansion island off of San Diego. Let's move there on a whim. It was like we had friends and family all baked in there. I'd been going there a million times you know, throughout my life. I would lived there multiple times. So it was sort of a second home in a lot of ways. And back in the day, it was a lot more chill. It was sort of a small Navy town, really. And obviously, over the last 15, 20 years, it's completely changed. But, you know, one thing led to another. And all of a sudden, I looked around. And this was a couple of years before I found fire. I was looking around and I was like, this is unsustainable. There's no way. Like, maybe we hit the lottery. Maybe I somehow or Taylor somehow figures out a way to make a million dollar salary. But I don't know. I was getting a little bit older and that lottery mentality was starting to, you know, kind of get fuzzy. And it's sort of like, oh, or maybe it was crystal clear. <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> uh, I don't think we're going to make that kind of money. And I need to put my ego aside. I need to come to a realization that I've got a ceiling. And what now? And then anyway, that was about two years of floundering and maybe trying to budget here and there. But it was more like my entrepreneurial mind kicked off and it was like how do i earn more money how do i find that side hustle what's the next big thing and that ended up stressing me out because i still had a full-time job that was traveling all the time and real physical grinding kind of work long hours with video production so all those things happened and stress was rising and body was breaking down and bank account was pretty thin and lifestyle was increasing and inflating and then boom mr money mustache hits me across the face i accidentally found him on tim ferris's podcast so I was listening to Tim Ferriss' podcast because I was trying to figure out how do I make more money? How do I, you know, think like these guys? And then luckily Pete came in and was like, here's some sense. Here's some <laughs> sense for you. Here's some stuff to do. <laughs> so you've definitely thrown out a whole lot of stuff there for us to unpack, but just kind of covering our tracks a little bit before you start getting into those moments where you're realizing this is unsustainable. You know, continue that growing up story you're looking at two different examples, one of which is a person making money that is kind of location agnostic. It's picking up, it's starting over again. It could be maybe seasonal. The other person, your father, is is a very regimented, like they're telling him where you're going to live, what you're going to do. The pay is set. You've got that pension. So one is very structured. One is much more flexible, but also uncertain. Did you find yourself at a certain time realizing like, I'm probably going to go more this path than that path? That's a great question. You know, if anything, I think, Going the entrepreneurial route was probably some sort of form of rebellion from my my upbringing. It, you know, that now that I think about it, back then it was just I didn't like control or having bosses or people telling me what to do very much. And so I, I thought entrepreneurship might be the way to go. And I felt like I came out of college at an interesting time when the Internet was really starting to build and expand and grow. So it was kind of, I think, a mix of really seeing opportunity at hand, realizing that it was getting easier and easier to run a small business and be an entrepreneur with all the online tools, you know, and automation. And then on the flip side, yeah, it's probably a little bit of rebellion against my regimented upbringing and my Navy, my Navy dad and all that stuff. But I thought a lot about joining the Navy when I was growing up. And I'm really blessed that my dad nudged me away from it. I think he knew my personality type and for one and two, you know, I just think it's not for everyone. I think serving is great. And if I could go back, I probably would have signed up for some kind of form of service that would have probably done me well. But making it a career was probably never, never going to be an option for me. So you mentioned earlier when you were going through the story of discovering fire, how you were working in that corporate job when kind of everything hit the fan. But you also have this entrepreneurial bug eating at you. Did you try anything entrepreneurial straight out of college? Did you have side hustles? What did that whole dynamic look like of regular life work versus all these side hustles and entrepreneurship type stuff? Yeah. So in college, I always actually all the way through like middle school through college, I had a job that was instilled in me at an early age. That was something I had to go do. And so, yeah, it was never a thought not to have some kind of gainful employment out of college. I ended up working for Anheuser-Busch and well, actually, I was in college working with Anheuser Bush and then out of college for a couple of years, same thing. And I kind of, but I did get pretty burnt out by all that. And I could have gone that route and gotten into sales and worked my way up and all that. But it just wasn't for me. That lifestyle is hard and, and it's expected. And it was time for me to, to find a change. And so I pivoted and went into an, another, you know, salaried position for a while. But what happened was actually I got laid off from that salaried position. And that was the first time I ever felt totally unsettled financially. And I was also three years out of college or something like that. And so this was the first time it was very serious and it was all on me. 
And so I kind of took a, a look at the landscape and I was with Taylor at the time. We weren't married yet, but I was with her and talked to her. She had a really stable job at the time. And I just looked around and said, you know, I think I think I can collect unemployment and live off of that for about three to four months while I build a business. And that's exactly what I did. Um, I sat down with a friend of mine. We decided to get into business together. And that was definitely something that was always eating away inside as, you know, can I do this on my own? Let me try this. And I went to the Nevada Small Business Development Center. That's what it was called. We were, we were living in Reno. And I just, I asked for help. You know, how do I do this? And just learn the building blocks of building a business. And we built, we spent three months building a business plan, very, very detailed business plan. It was actually a proposal for an indoor golf center in Reno. And Reno's a pretty big golf area and it's got casinos and all that. So I had gotten into this with a buddy of mine who was a, a golf pro. So he knew that side of the business. And then I was going to take the, I don't know, the front of house. I don't know what you would call it. We spent three months building that and we ended up going over to San Francisco or Sacramento, maybe it was Sacramento. And we took that business plan into a couple different businesses or I'm getting stumbled up because they weren't venture capitalists, I don't think. And if they were, they were just probably smiling at us as we walked in and left. But we ended up raising a couple hundred thousand dollars to start this this indoor golf center. And it's really funny. I, I ended up walking away. We both walked away from it. The more we looked at it and we had done so much research and the projections that we had worked on showed us that it would take a ton of time and effort to start being profitable. And I think once it hit, once the realization hit that we sort of had accomplished our goal of raising the money necessary and building the plan and seeing the dream out, when it actually came like push come to shove, it was like, I don't want to take this person's money and go work this hard for this long for this margin. But what a learning experience, you know. What was cool was I had developed relationships in the small business development center. And I walked in with my head down and, you know, my tail between my legs. And I was like, yeah, so that that didn't work out. And I've been taking unemployment for a few months here. And I'd really like to stop doing that. So I need to find a job or something. And the guy who was, you know, slowly become a friend and a mentor over these months, Rod Jorgensen, these are the people you never forget, you know. He's like, yeah, we'll bring in your resume and we'll talk about it. And I brought in my resume and I had worked for a while at a PGA tour tournament. And in that time, I was the marketing and sales manager. And again, I'd come out of college and it was like Facebook was like a thing where you needed a college email to even have a profile back then. There was no business page. You couldn't even sell ads. And so you had to create a business page through a personal profile and all this stuff to, you know, to kind of hack the system at the time. That was all starting to change. Business pages were just launched at this time and all this stuff. Anyway, I got our little PGA Tour tournament on Twitter. I remember before the PGA Tour had a Twitter handle. So I felt a little OG there, but I had this real world professional experience in social media marketing that in 2009, no one had. It was very rare because businesses weren't putting any money into that. That wasn't something you could really, there was no industry around it. So He just took one look at that and said, everybody that comes in here who owns a small business is asking me how to do the social media thing, how to get on the internet thing and to do that thing that they don't know anything about. And this would be awesome. You should do this. So I quickly pivoted. I had that business plan. I had all that background and it didn't take me long to develop a a business plan for a basically a remote sales social media management job that was the only of its kind and at the time. And it was kind of cool. There was a coinciding co-working space that was opening for the first time. It was the first co-working space ever in Reno that we're, that I'm aware of. And it fostered a little environment of entrepreneurship. And a lot of these people that were my, my co-workers were also in online business, most of them. And so uh, like I remember one of the co-workers, she was working on a, an app that worked with Etsy to help business owners or people just making stuff at that time. It was like DIY run taxes on any profits. That was in 09. You know, I'm sure that's that's like an application that could have been sold to Etsy because Etsy was probably like, oh, that's wonderful. We didn't even think of that. Or, you know, or, oh, man, this is this is better than the one we're working on. You know, so that was that was the early days. I, I remember, I'm starting to remember like Douala and Foursquare and all these check in apps and things like anyway, it was a wild, wild west landscape. And I was able to build a small business out of that. It was kind of right place at the right time mixed with some some real hard couple of months of real hard work and the universe converged and. I've basically been an entrepreneur since I have taken a couple of full time gigs through that, but always with a like a side gig running. That's an awesome story of, you know, just kind of changing and pivoting based on your skill set. And I mean, it's good that you obviously had that mentor to nudge you that way. But, you know, we always try to give some tactical kind of tangible tips for people listening. And 
I think a lot of times when people will either start a business, especially in that scenario where you're in a business that you don't really have anything to look at and follow is kind of pricing. So when you started that and you're trying to price out your services, I think something I hear often is people undervalue themselves. So how did you navigate that? Like when you're working with these businesses, you're doing something that they've never paid anybody to do before. You've never gotten paid to do it. So, you know, how did you start figuring out like, what am I worth? Like, what should I charge these people? What are they willing to pay me? How far can I go? All those questions you just asked are exactly what you need to be asking and you need to iterate on that. There's no like, I mean, first of all, you know, that's a big, vast question with endless answers because it totally depends on so many factors. That said, there are some tactics you can use to to hone that in and get better and better at it. First of all, if you're just starting off, I would actually recommend that you undervalue yourself because you need to go prove your value. I hear a lot of debate about this on various podcasts. Some people will say, like, make sure you don't overvalue yourself. Go hit up uh, peers or competitors and see if you can figure out what they're charging. You know, I would actually recommend you go the opposite way. Go to someone who you know is using one of your competitors. And so you reverse engineer it that way. That That's great. But the competitor that you're um, going to be competing against, if you've been in business for a while, then you'll have already known this. But if you're just getting started, They've already got the leg up on you. So you're going to have to undercut them in price to try to win that business if you're trying to win business that way. In my case, I was creating a completely new service from scratch. And so it was really a matter of trying to gauge the comfort level of their budgets. You know, what are they willing to spend on this service and will it bring them ROI? So if you're thinking about pricing, I would actually say the first thing you should do is try to spend twice as much time figuring out what the ROI of your service is going to be and present that in a way that makes your clients feel incredibly warm and fuzzy. Not to the point where it's nefarious, but just making sure that it's as clear as possible. Because I think a lot of times when we're doing work for people, there's a lot of stuff that goes unchecked or untracked, let's say. And, you know, it's just part of what you do. And so it's really easy to forget all those little pieces that you're doing. So trying to really hone in like all the things that you're doing and making sure that you understand mentally, like the mindset of that is all valuable. Your time is incredibly valuable. That will help serve you as you start to feel out those clients budgets, as you start to feel out how far you can push that dial. And so, you know, it's almost like taking a a loss leader approach where the first couple, you just you, t- you eat it in the shorts, whatever, you take it, you take what you can get, just get the work started. And then at that point, you can probably develop the relationships necessary to say, what would you pay for this? You know, I'm just getting started out. A lot of people just want to help you. A lot of people are, are A, impressed, B, maybe like kind of envious. Maybe they want to do something like that, too. They're working at their gig and, you know, they're and, and if you're doing a good job, they're happy to have found you because you're providing them this service that's making their life easier. That's the whole point. And so they're willing to help you. They want to help you. Yeah. I think a lot of people find themselves in jobs where they're not super happy with. They want to start something, but then they start getting into the, like, I don't think I'm worth this. And I think that discussion is is very helpful on figuring out how they can start at least getting an idea of what they are quote unquote worth, you know, just so they get a starting point. If they're struggling with whether they're worth it or not, there's a book that I would highly recommend. It's called The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. And it's one of my favorite books ever. It talks about the resistance and that feeling of, you know, finding how how valuable you are, if that idea that you have, that's worthwhile. Read this book because it talks about if you have this idea and you're feeling resistance, you need to lean into that resistance. That is the sign that you're fearful. And that fear is coming from the fact that inside, you know, there's something that needs to get out and you're worried about it because it's going to disrupt the world. Right. Because we, we all fear change inherently. It's a just it's a wonderful perspective because I, I always thought in my mind that I don't fear change. Change is good. I've been moving around my whole life. Oh, I'm good. But I think that's BS. I, I think we all inherently fear some level of change. It's not to say we can't still train ourselves to move forward and, and lean into it. So, yeah, The War of Art, Stephen Pressfield, one of my favorite books. So you are definitely a big idea guy. You are not scared to tackle projects that other people might be scared to tackle. Like you had the golf business. You had this startup social media marketing company. You had, we haven't even talked about it yet, Playing With Fire, just the whole brand, the documentary, the book, all that crazy stuff. From a mindset perspective, what makes you feel comfortable jumping into some of these things when, for example, like when you had that job, when you quit that job, we just talked about pricing, but 
I know from your story, I'm cheating a little bit, that you weren't always a frugal guy until you discovered Mr. Money Mustache. And usually sometimes you can kind of grab security from being frugal. You're like, all right, my baseline expenses are $1,200 a month. That's not that hard to achieve if I just go full-blown entrepreneur. So what kind of things did you have in place, whether it was maybe Taylor's financially secure job, whether it was some type of mindset that you adopted that made you feel comfortable taking those leaps? I think, you know, various leaps stemmed from various scenarios, but I think it's one of those things where, you know, maybe I'm missing a couple of uh, brain cells. <laughs> My wife has been a rock in our relationship, and that has helped me make those jumps and leaps and risks. And so I'm a forever grateful for that. B <laughs> forever in debt <laughs> to her. <laughs> and that would probably be regardless of, of the entrepreneurial stuff. But it's never been a unilateral decision that I've made. It's always been, you know, something that we've talked about together and we understood the risks going in. And I think that's a big piece is understanding the risks going in. And I think it's kind of fun to parallel that to fire and what I came to the realization of at a Chautauqua through Paula Pant. She was doing a presentation and I had never heard this prior to her saying this and I just love it. When you start to learn about fire and you go down the rabbit hole and you've got this frugality foundation happening, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I just was beside myself. It literally changed our lives, as you can tell with, you know, documenting it as thoroughly as we did. It was so it was such a fundamental shift in the way we thought about our actions, our choices and also our future. And yet there's always this lingering feeling of like, Am I making a mistake? Is this is this really going to work? You start to see articles being written like, oh, what about this? And oh, the fire movement thinks they're going to do that. And this was all starting to fester in my head a bit. And we were out at Chautauqua in Ecuador. And I was pretty stoked about that, you know, meeting all my heroes and talking to like minded people who know everything, know, know this language and know what I'm talking about when we're talking about safe withdrawal rates and whatnot. And then Paula got up there and I don't remember the majority of her her presentation, but I do remember at the end she was like, you know, so what's the worst case scenario with all this stuff? I just said, what's the worst case scenario? And she's like, well, I guess the worst case scenario would be if your plan falls through and, you know, the world's crashing down, you go back to work. And I just thought, oh, my gosh, it's so simple. Like the worst case scenario in a fire plan is that you go back to work. <laughs> okay, I like this. This this calms me down. This makes me feel good. And I feel like that that's the parallel with with entrepreneurship. It's like you go, you try, go and attempt that dream. If you've got something that you cannot shake, you know, that idea or just that feeling that you want to go do that thing, go do that thing. You know, build a plan for it. Be smart about your choices. Face that fear. Read that book, The War of Art, and get that plan ready and execute. You know, just pull the pull the trigger and and do so in a way. Take the time to set yourself up so that if it doesn't work out, you go back to work. You figure out a way to go back to gameful play. And I, I just feel like that is something that isn't given enough credence. I just feel like when I see entrepreneurs, people who kind of dream about side hustles, who you can tell the itch is there. Oftentimes, it's that fear that's holding them back. And it's not, it's not like an actual good reason not to do that thing. I'm not special. I'm not special in the stuff that I've done. I'm not. All that is, is a little bit of stupidity, a whole lot of luck, a lot of help from other people and hard work. So one of the big things that sticks out to me with your story is another kind of one of these mindset angles is that you're in this lifestyle where you're saving like 8% of your income, but you realized it. Like you realized like this was not going to be sustainable. This couldn't go on forever. You probably were not going to hit the salary lottery and you made some changes. What do you think it is that's keeping most people from just at least having the realization, even if they don't necessarily like take to the fire movement, because I feel like I meet so many people who have high income jobs, they live in big, nice houses, they have a really good life, but they don't even realize how close they are to that being unsustainable. Like one life event could send them to a point they can't recover from, even though things look so great now and they just never have that realization. Such a good question. And I've met a lot of these people too, being out and about and talking about fire and supporting the the movement. And it's hard to get in people's heads, but my inclination is that it's fear of what you'll uncover because spending is not this innocuous thing. It is tied to our value system. It's tied to our choices and our choices are inherently part of who we are, how we see ourselves. It's tied to our ego. And if you're living paycheck to paycheck, the odds are that there's some choices in there that you regret. And so you fear that regret and it's easier to bury your head in the sand. It's easier to 
wait till next month and then push down the road. That's what I truly think is holding people back. Because when you meet people that have that have taken that leap, that is that have jumped off that diving board, every single one of them will say like that part was hard and gross and scary and and all the things. But gosh, I'm so glad I did it, you know, and and now we're this and now this is great. And look at what we're doing here and there. And it's like and then they just they light up. And then you talk to people who are hesitant and they haven't quite got there yet. And well, what about this? And they're asking all these questions and they've got all this resistance to it. And you don't see them lighting up after that. You know, they don't, they're not like, well, I don't know about that. Uh, hey, I've got a big car payment coming. I've got a house that's bigger <laughs> than I need. Oh, I'm so excited. I'm going to go on a second vacation. I'm already tired from my first one. Woohoo! You don't hear that. And so what do you guys think? You've been there on the block too. For me, I think it's just one of these things where we get comfortable. Like we just do what we see everyone else around us do. There's just kind of these inherent expectations that our that culture has that this is just what you're supposed to do. Because like what we're doing is, you know, I think we're so comfortable with it. We love it so much that sometimes we forget how small of a piece of the pie we are in the population. Like people talk about what if everyone joined the fire movement? Like we're not even close to getting on a register of a percentage of people who are doing this. So we're such a small niche in the population that like, it's probably the other way around. Like how in the world do we think that, you know, how did we think that we, this was even capable to save 70%. So it's probably more realistic that someone would think like that that's fine because everyone else around them is doing it and they seem fine. And I think another part of that is something you have a lot of expertise in, which is all this kind of social media stuff, because as we're looking around, everything's fine. It's because most of the news we get about individuals is only the positive stuff. Like we don't get a lot of dirty laundry, you know, shared out. Like sure, you get a lot of bad news on CNN, whatever, but just day-to-day life decisions, you don't really see like, oh, hey guys, like I'm paying 20% interest on this car. It's really screwing me over. Like, you know, I'm getting a little scared of what I'm going to do, how I'm going to like feed the kids. Like you don't see those stories being shared on Facebook. So I think that plays into it as well. I totally agree. I think there's there's two different ways to look at that. You had originally asked that question with the mindset of like they they are aware of fire but have failed to pull the trigger. And that's different than why does 68% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck, right? I think the true issue and the reason why I did what I did with the documentary in the book is when I found this, I was shocked that I had never heard about it before. Once I let people know that I found this, I found out that a bunch of my friends did know about this. And and that's even worse to me. That was egregious. Like, hey, Joe, what you knew about Mr. Money Mustache? You didn't tell me. <laughs> um, and the problem is, is we don't talk about money in this country. It, it is a complete taboo to talk about, in my opinion, unless it's about, like you said, the positive. Right. It's like, oh, like, look at all this stuff that's happening. That's great. But it's never I'm worried about paying my bills next month. Well, I mean, that's shifting a bit, I would say that you, you can find people complaining about not having money. But it's you're not hearing people talk about solutions unless you go out and look for it. And I think that even today, I think it's changed, though. I mean, I would say, like, I found this in early 2017. And I think even if you just look at today in early 2020, in three years, it feels like this has grown. It There is there is much more coverage of it than before. As far as I can tell, there's more interest. The groups are growing. It's consolidating. It's starting to hone its message and get that microphone going and that megaphone going. So it's very encouraging. But back then, that was not the case. And like you said, we're still this little niche endeavor. I don't know what what the hell we are movement. And it's one of those things where I just looked at it and went at first I went, I am so angry that I didn't that no one ever told me about this, that I didn't know this, that my friends didn't know this, my family didn't know this. And if they did, that they didn't tell me. And then if I had found Mr. Money Mustache when I was in my 20s, my early 20s, I don't know if it would have resonated. And it started. I started to realize that I think you have to be in a certain stage in life, a certain place in life to receive the message. You know, I think if you had taught this to me in high school, I would have found this later in life and been, oh, yeah, I kind of remember some of that stuff from back then. But uh, it, yeah, now it really applies to me. So I guess I'll check this out as opposed to me being like, how have I never heard this before? <laughs> you know, and so I think. It's a matter of there's a massive lack of financial literacy in this country. And it's probably if you really go down that rabbit hole, there's probably some nefarious reasons for that. And I think, you know, what we're doing as a FI movement at large is we're trying to open people's eyes to how simple it is. That does not make it easy, but it is simple to understand. And I would argue and, you know, Mr. Money Mustache argues very well that it doesn't take much 
to be happy in this country. We are so blessed to be here and in most industrialized nations. And so if you can get, if you're in that, that position of let's call it privilege, the privilege to be in a, in a fantastic society and not be worried about, you know, your safety (laughs) and all the, all the things that it comes with, then it's sort of a, a huge waste. If you're squandering that opportunity, living paycheck to paycheck in constant fear and stress and not enjoying your life, not even having this mental space to find any semblance of happiness when it's right there. It's right there at your doorstep. Oh, man, you opened up a can of worms with that one. <laughs> yeah, I, I loved everything you just covered there, Scott. I totally resonate with that. Like, people don't want this information fed to them typically. I know you're saying, like, how did I not know about this? Why didn't Joe tell me? But, like, I tell a lot, all of my friends all this stuff, and I've had maybe one or two act on it at all. They just don't want to be told. They have to be in that spot where they are looking for the information and then you can be their guide or their Sherpa. And something else you mentioned is like two of the main reasons people are scared of doing this or anything in general is fear and resistance to change. And kind of going back to your story, it's 2017, you figure out the fire movement, you and Taylor are living this somewhat lavish lifestyle. I wouldn't say you're balling out completely, but you were saving like eight to 10% of your income, definitely could have been saving more. Could you talk about, and I know you cover this really well, the emotions of it in the documentary, but some of those tangible decisions and like how those actually felt in that moment, like, you know, stripping that expensive car, cutting down the grocery bill, all that tactical stuff that really makes a difference. Yeah. I mean, I remember like it's yesterday because it's it's yesterday. I still, I'm still going through those emotions all the time with the car specifically. (laughs) That's my wife's problem. I, I'm a I'm a big fan of engineering marvels that are sports cars. I'm a, I'm a big fan of cool old Broncos and you know just whatever. Like I, I'm into that stuff, but not more than I am my freedom. Not more than I am you know my financial situation. So for me, it was pretty easy to logically separate those two things and say like I'll drive whatever gets me there if that means that I can gain financial freedom. My wife, however, I I think it's a comfort thing. I think there's still some social stuff going on there. It's difficult for her to pull up in a 2006 Honda CRV that's got, you know, more scratches and dents than I care to admit and 250,000 miles on it. And it just looks a little tired. It might be a little saggy in the back. I don't know, you know, (laughs) and she pulls up and her friends are not driving those things regardless of their status or their income level or whatever. Everyone seems to drive a pretty nice car or at least a five year old or less car, it seems. And I think that just kind of she's worried about what that says. She there's still something there. And by the way, she's aware that I feel like that's silly, that the fire movement certainly feels like that's a bit silly. She's aware of those things. She knows the reasons why she shouldn't feel that way. She's aware of those things, but it's still a reality for her. And so, you know, that inherently also is a reality for me. I still kind of pay that price a little bit, right? Because I'm sort of the reason why she's not driving a nice car because I found this stuff. And so it is a daily thing. Like we go through it where I hear it every once in a while, like, oh, you yeah, know, that car. OK, you know, that kind of thing. And I'm sitting there going, I love this thing. You know, it's still running. I could never get the value out of it that I feel like it's valued to us right now. So I don't even want to get rid of it. You know, when it comes to food, like I think those are the two biggest things to talk about, because those are the two easiest things to change for people that can make the most impact. Right. The big three are housing, cars and food. It's a little bit hard for a lot of people to move, but you can change up your transportation situation almost overnight in most cases. And you can certainly change your eating habits and your spending habits when it comes to food overnight. So those are two huge pieces. And so with food, I mean, that for me, that is absolutely a constant struggle because, A, I accidentally spoiled myself in my spending years. And so I know what I want and I know how much I like it. It's sort of a depraved (laughs) sort of spectrum to some extent. However, this is what I love about the fire movement is when you really once you've got the surface level stuff and your foundations are set, then you can really dive deep. And I think it's a mindset shift where you suddenly realize things like, you know what, I'm going to buy this set of all clad amazing pots and pans. And the only way that I can justify doing that is saying I am going to eat home for the next year and that will save me so much more money. And I'm buying these because I can now make better food with this. This is an equipment sport. Making food is an equipment sport, (laughs) right? I need the right equipment to make that food restaurant grade. And going to the grocery store is being very deliberate about what we can buy in bulk, what we what we will go run down the street for, you know, when we buy produce, how we buy all that stuff. 
And we've got it down where we've slashed that budget hugely, and yet we're still eating really well. We also implemented uh, intermittent fasting. That cuts out a whole meal <laughs> and makes us feel better and makes us healthier. So there's all these little you know, level ups that we can make, but that has taken time. That wasn't overnight. And I think that's what people also need to remember all the time is that you can take this step by step. This can become a process that you that you start to ease into. You do not have to decide today and then start tomorrow to do every single thing because it's so disruptive. I actually disagree. I, I, or I would say, don't do that. You know, take the next month and say, we're going to work on this one budget item. Take that next month. We're going to work on this one budget item. If you start to feel more comfortable, add a couple more in. Just dip your toes. That's how we think about it. That's what's been happening for us. Like the, you know, the food thing, I do now feel like we've got it pretty well whipped where the impulse to go out because it's easier, because it's less stressful, because we're hungry right then, because we feel like we want that specific type of food at that moment. That stuff has waned a bit. You know, it still happens from time to time. But now I feel like we've done such a good job that when that mood strikes, we have a better sort of gauge as to is this really how I feel and will this really bring me happiness tonight? Or am I just feeling this right now? Is this my monkey brain saying this? And I'd be perfectly fine with a rice bowl with some veggies and da 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 da. And then if it is, let's go get pizza or let's go get this thing. I'm fine with that because I've really run that through a filter and I've been deliberate about it. And I have already done like I've earned it. You know, the last two weeks we've been eating at home. And so I've earned that night out and it feels better. It's better because of that. And that's the stoic philosophy. And that's what really resonated with me with Pete, Mr. Money Mustache's writing was that stoic philosophy that I did not have. And once I understood more about how that can really benefit you, I think that is ultimately kind of the philosophy of the fire movement. I think it's probably pretty safe to say. And another author that talks about that is Ryan Holiday, who's in our movie. We get some flack sometimes because we had like the minimalists and Ryan Holiday in our movie who aren't in the fire movement. And I don't understand that. <laughs> it's like minimalism is a thing. Stoic philosophy is a thing like that you can utilize. It's an element of all of this. Why wouldn't that be in the film? I don't get it. So I have to agree that, you know, being conscious and just being intentional are definitely, you know, those are like the cornerstones of this, like sitting back and looking at something and just doing a little bit of analysis and not just knee jerk buying something, but buying something with purpose is just a huge piece of this. But we have started now getting into the documentary, the Playing With Fire documentary. And you just talked about like a little bit of flack you got. And one thing I really wanted to ask, because I know anytime, even if you're just like a part of a project, but especially when you're creating the project, no matter how proud you are of it, you're probably going to look back and there's going to be some things where, man, I wish we could have spent more time on this. I wish we could have talked a little bit more about this. You know, this is something that didn't come across the way exactly I wanted it to. Is there anything with the documentary that you wish you could have covered more, said differently, whatever it might be? I love this question. <laughs> Thank you for asking it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the end. <laughs> the end. <laughs> So one thing about making films is there are so many roads you can go down and ultimately it could become a scenario where, especially with documentaries, especially not when it's scripted, when it's in documentary format, there are 10,000 different ways you could make that film and you can tinker with it and tinker with it and never, never. end. and so you like a tactic is you actually set a, a hard deadline. It has to be done by this time. You have to walk away from it at that at that date. And it, such was the case with our, our documentary, which we went way over budget and production timeline on editing. So we had even more time than we had prescribed for ourselves. And it still is down to that last wire. I had a full re-edit sent to, I sent that to Travis, the director and the editing team. They rejected it hard. <laughs> we had a big conference meeting about it, but I had... Uh, basically a full rewrite of the documentary. I'd rearranged everything into a completely different puzzle piece. We didn't end up going that route. I'm still curious to know if it, what it, what would have, you know, I wish we could a B test a documentary. <laughs> It'd be the coolest thing in the world. But the things that we missed, I think overall we are as a team really, really, really proud of, of the work that came out. We did our, the best we could to tell an engaging and entertaining story around personal finance <laughs> And it took, I realized this later, that it took a human story, sort of a hero's journey to make it interesting. 
my original idea for the doc was really to go around as sort of the journalist. I was going to put myself in front of the camera, but more as like, I've learned about this thing and now I'm going to go out and learn about it so that you can as the viewer. And it turned into no, tra when, once I got connected with Travis, he was like, no, 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 no. The, we're going to be in your while you're going through all this stuff. You're going to be in the trenches and we're going to go along with you. And that's interesting. And then you'll also go out and meet all these people. Okay, fair enough. What I think was tough about that was we kind of knew what we were getting into. I've been in video production for a long time, but I've never been in front. I've always been behind the camera. And so you cannot be prepared for that invasiveness. And especially when you're going through this fundamental shift in the way you're living and the choices that you're making, all the things that it takes to successfully pursue a fire lifestyle. That was very difficult. And there were many, many moments where Taylor and I were quarreling, fighting, whatever you want to call it, just totally disconnected, out of sync, that we weren't comfortable sharing or we didn't have a production day set that day. I wasn't going to get my phone out in the middle of a fight. It didn't, didn't make sense. There's moments that I look back on and I wish, wish I had. I really wish I had because at the time it felt sensitive and it felt not something I would want to share that anybody would want to see. But I think back now and I'm like, man, there was there were a few of those conversations that would have just I think would have made the film because they were so compelling and raw and real. And they're the things that we were going through that we we couldn't share all of it. Some of that summed up in this one scene where I'm kind of talking about the stability of our relationship. And that was all very, very real. A little odd to be walking around and selfieing myself and talking about it. But it, you kind of forget you're doing that after just a minute or two. I, I still watch that scene and I remember those feelings and it was it was very real. But. So that's one is is just some of the the footage we didn't catch. Two was Taylor's journey towards the end. I've heard some feedback that it feels a bit abrupt, that she's really struggling, she's really struggling, and then all of a sudden she's okay. We were watching people that were just, you know, absolutely happy, spending a hell of a lot less than we were even at that point when we had already slashed our budget so hard. And I think Taylor did have sort of a fire related spiritual awakening at Camp Mustache where she saw she saw that and that really resonated with her. And I and you can see it in that scene, but I don't think it was compelling enough. There wasn't enough from her to kind of lead the audience through that. And so once you get past that and then she's kind of like, all right, you know, we're in Ben and things are better. And I also kind of felt like that was not quite as developed as I would have loved. And I think that's really important because some people that see it that way, then they don't they use that as a mechanism to say not trust her journey. And, oh, that's all bullshit, right? And then it's just immediately discounted as a as sort of a fake story, fake news. And so, but look, I mean, I don't know that I I saw that prior to, you know, saying, okay, that's a wrap. It's something you see after watching it with an audience multiple times. When you see the movie a bunch of times, you start to kind of feel some of those things out. But, ah, we did what we could, you know. Like, it'd be nice to kind of open up the project and maybe have another stab at it. But that was a big piece. I also wish we had more access to some of the people that were in the film. Believe it or not, that was the hardest part of making the film was getting building the trust and gaining access to the people that are in the film, period. I mean, there were people we had to not take no for an answer, like be such a squeaky wheel that they're just like, fine. <laughs> there were people that would invite you to the thing, you know, have you do the thing and then you get there with the whole crew and then it just doesn't work for them at that moment for whatever reason. And you're like, really like you know do you know how it took to get to this point the access was was difficult and so there were moments you know there's certain there's certain cast members that we were hoping to get certain angles that we that we missed out on in the film that we didn't get so those are some other things i wish we would have got uh, one thing was it was is the perspective that i've i've seen float around from time to time about the fire movement actually being really good for the environment and what, what it could mean to to you know consume less to drive less to design your life in in such a way and if that spreads like that kind of impact that we could have globally i wish we would have gotten more of that we had plans to but it they fell through well thank you scott like you said this is definitely a worthy discussion i will always think that someone having a basic understanding of personal finance and the time they spend doing that will impact their life more in that amount of time than any other thing they could possibly do, any other skill they could learn, any other thing they could invest their time with, just learning about personal finance and taking that seriously. You've done a great job of that. We appreciate the story and how much you've spread this news out to everyone. We really appreciate that. And we appreciate you coming on here and giving us some of your time. And if people want to keep following your journey, because it's certainly not over, like where would be the best place for them to do that or contact you? 
Appreciate that. Appreciate you guys having me on. It's been a joy to get to know you in person and over the the Skypes. And we just started a podcast. It's called Playing With Fire as well. And Taylor and I are taking on monthly challenges, mental, physical, and fiscal challenges. And we ask that people come along the ride with us. And they're also built so that they can be had at any time. You can take them at any time. So we're building out these challenges as we go. There'll be 12 a year. So you can go back and start one up anytime. We've got some apps that we use to track and all this stuff. So it's been kind of fun. And we've gotten through our first challenge just last week, which was practicing gratitude. So we spend 21 days practicing gratitude at various levels. And then we check in weekly and talk about our progress, what we're seeing, highs and lows. We're hoping to bring in some experts. We haven't done that yet, but we will. And yeah, that's kind of like we see this as if you were to watch the documentary and read the book or and or you're going to learn about a bunch of different people in the fire movement that we recommend you go learn about. And when you do that, you're going to go down the rabbit hole and you're going to find a bunch of other people and you're going to find the voices that resonate with you. And our hope is that you find the foundation of fire or fi, whatever you want. And if work matters to you, if it doesn't matter to you, if you want to get out of your job, if you like your job, it doesn't really matter. The point is, is financial independence or financial freedom. And if you build that foundation for us, it did become more or less a set it and forget it and every once in a while check in kind of system. And so I, I'm not saying I'm bored of personal finance or FI, I'm not, but I don't constantly absorbing it every single day like I was. But I also have this inclination that there's going to be things I just I got to be honest with myself and say, I don't want to do that thing. That That sounds nice. That might be great. I don't want it. So we're going to go through those challenges together, hopefully, and find out, you know, find those little uh, life hacks together. So, yeah, that's what we're doing. Sweet, man. Well, I'll definitely be tuning in. Hopefully some of our listeners can join in on these challenges. One question we like to ask all of our guests is if you could boil it down, I know it's tough, to your number one tip for people on the path to financial independence, what would that be? The number one tip I would have for people who are considering pursuing a fire lifestyle or who are interested in this in any way, who haven't already been convinced, I would say sit down tonight. Sit down tonight. If you have a significant other, if you have a roommate, whatever it is, if you're by yourself, doesn't matter. And write down the top five things that make you happy on a weekly basis. This is something that we had never done. My wife and I had never done prior to finding fire. It was an idea that I found or read or had. I don't remember how I found it or, or where it came from, but it was simple. It's just write down five things that make you happy on a weekly basis. Not a monthly because a lot can happen in a month. Not daily because it's too granular. But we kind of live our lives and plan our lives in weekly sort of formats. So what, 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 what is it in a week that you can do that makes you happy? And write down those five things. If you have more, go to 10. And then if you have someone with you that's doing this, share it with them. And if you're doing it by yourself, review this, this list. And then look at that list as it pertains to your spending. And what you're doing is you're starting to align your values with your spending. And what you'll probably find out is that the majority of that list doesn't cost a thing. For me, that was sort of this eye-opening exercise that allowed us to be open to the, the rest of the onslaught of ideas, strategies, and tactics that you can find to create a fire lifestyle for yourself. That is the number one tip I would have for people who are who have not pursued a fire lifestyle, but are maybe fire curious. <laughs> Love that, man. All righty, Scott. Well, we've put you through the gauntlet and you've made it through almost everything, but there is one final hurdle. And that is a question that I didn't prepare for, Cody didn't prepare for, so we know you didn't prepare for, and that is the wild card question. So even though you're not prepared, are you ready? I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so the question I want to ask you today is, as someone who's spent so much time both behind and now in front of the camera, especially in this documentary setting, what do you think when you see these things like the Tiger King documentary exploding on Netflix? <laughs> I think I'm supposed to despise someone named Carol. <laughs> I've deduced that. I haven't seen it yet. That's such a good question, man. I My brain goes in a couple different directions. One is I'm always so proud of filmmakers that make it because I've been through the process and it's one of the hardest things I've ever had to do in my entire life and it, making a documentary specifically. I'm assuming scripted is equally as difficult, but it is such a slog. I remember hearing some advice about writing a book and it's like you have this idea has to be in your mind. You have to get it out. You want to want it out in the world so badly that you would give up everything for a full year and only do that thing. And if you feel that way, if you feel that strongly, then you go write that book. 
And and that's very similar with documentaries, only I would give it three years. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a slog, it's such a process, and it's such a risk that anytime I see something doing well, I'm just like, good for you guys. That's awesome. Now, that's the nice answer. <laughs> 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 the other side of my brain is like, knowing that that self-absorption and that opulence and the ridiculous waste of money and time and energy on stuff like that when there's so many other things we can you know be spending with our time to improve the world around us it's a little frustrating <laughs> <laughs> not only for my own documentary but for documentaries everywhere that have championed a cause that's worthwhile and it just doesn't quite reach the level of tiger king fame <laughs> <laughs> Love the honesty, man. <laughs> that said, I'm going to go watch that tonight. <laughs> <laughs> well, Scott, I can say Justin and I have had a lot of fun today on the podcast. So that means it was a good one. And we appreciate you just coming on, sharing your story. We got into some of the nitty gritty that I haven't really heard before on other podcasts and other formats. So I'm glad we could uncover some stuff that I was personally curious about. And then just your whole journey. So thank you for doing everything you do, for putting out the documentary, Playing With Fire, for the book, the podcast you're now doing. You're making an impact, man, and appreciate your time today. Hey, same to you guys both. Thank you for having me on. I appreciated the invite when you sent it like FinCon last year. I appreciate that we finally got this together and all the work you're doing is great too. So keep on keeping on, man. I appreciate it. Man, Cody, I really enjoyed this episode because after seeing the movie, there's all these things that you want to ask to go along with the movie that you know you didn't get to see. So I really appreciated getting to do that. What'd you think about the episode? Yeah, I've been trying to get Scott on for a while, as he alluded to in the episode. We've been back and forth. He's just super busy. We do have a lot of guests booked up, but finally we got Scott on the podcast and it was such a pleasure because like you said, he didn't always start on this fire path. He wasn't born saving 50% of his income. He didn't go through college knowing that, you know what, I'm going to retire in 10 years. I'm going to save as much as I possibly can. I'm not going to get sucked into this lifestyle inflation thing and kind of hearing him go through that emotional roller coaster and go through that with his wife, Taylor, as well was really interesting to hear from the horse's mouth because like you, I've seen the documentary multiple times, but being able to dig in and really dive into the concepts in that documentary that you and I are interested about, that was really fun. Scott is also able to give us that angle into that mindset of people who aren't savers naturally because I know me and you are both those people like we just naturally can save easily. It's fun to us, but you know, those people who are living a little bit larger lifestyles who are not thinking about retiring anytime soon, who are maybe living beyond their means. And then to have that realization that, hey, this isn't sustainable, but he's seen it on both sides. And so that's really cool to be able to get into maybe the minds that is probably more common in our culture. And that's very helpful because if you can't really see their point of view, it's a lot harder to come across with a message that isn't confrontational. And something that you and I, Justin, have talked about a lot is the writing down a list. It could be five, it could be 10 things, but writing down that list of what really makes you happy. I actually recently, probably last month, did this with my girlfriend and we wrote down our list. They were super similar, which was nice to see. And pretty much everything on the list didn't cost much money. And Scott went and did this with his wife, Taylor, and they figured out that, hey, you know what? We enjoy spending time together. We enjoy going on walks. We enjoy sitting in the park. We don't as much enjoy buying fancy cars buying a big house where we have a $3,000 mortgage payment every month. And after they came to that realization, like literally putting the pencil to the pad, that's when they started to make those little incremental changes. And that was another thing I really liked that Scott focused on. He's like, yeah, housing, transportation, and food are the big three, but make sure you get those small wins right at the start. Because yes, housing is going to be, for most people, the biggest factor in monthly spending, but everyone can't just go up and move houses tomorrow. If you live with a big family or you're just in an area where the only job that you think you can get is near that house, it might be really difficult to eliminate or at least reduce that housing expense. But things like cutting Netflix, eating out less, buying cheaper groceries, these are all things you can do next week, next month, or just sometime in the near future. And now it's time for the call to action. And Cody, the call to action this week is just that, to write down those five 10 things that are most meaningful to you. And if you have a partner, make sure you maybe include them in that discussion. If you don't, maybe you could find like a friend or something to bounce things off of to just kind of check yourself with. But write down those five, 10 things that are really important to you. And then as you start looking at your spending, make sure the things you're spending money on actually align to those. And that can be in a positive or negative way. So maybe you're not spending enough money on the things that bring you value, but you're spending way too much on things that don't. 
Alrighty, well, that's an awesome call to action, Justin. I think it is such a valuable exercise and it can really help you align your spending with your values. And if you enjoyed what you heard in today's episode, you want to check out more about Scott, you want to read the detailed show notes and maybe look at the movie, the book, his podcast, all that awesome stuff, you can do that at thefyshow.com slash Scott. And as always, if you want to check out our Facebook group page, you can do so at thefyshow.com slash community. And we always appreciate those five-star reviews. They help us get great guests like we had today. And if you're interested in supporting The Fi Show, you can do so by checking out some of our partners over at the resources page, which can be found at thefyshow.com slash resources. And thanks for listening.